So it's last last session, last last session before lunch, last session before the the golf tournament. So it's an important session. Um, and I was going to start by saying that open access has been uh, a key issue uh, throughout the uh, these three days. And now I was wondering if I should turn to uh, change that to uh, uh, the obscure alternative, which I really loved in Janine's presentation. Um, but it has been a, a key issue, and yesterday, in yesterday's session on the public as, uh, access policies, uh, the session brought us up to speed with what's happening with OA mandates uh, internationally. Then Karen's uh, presentation gave us really great insights into the impact open access has on book, on monograph publishing um, in the humanities, social sciences. Uh, the impact on, on workflows, but also the perceptions of the different teams, which I thought was really uh, very enlightening, the editorial marketing process and systems. Um, and I thought that it was pr particularly enlightening to hear the types of questions and very pragmatic questions that came from the different quarters <clears throat> of, a, of the, the publishing area. Uh, the questions like, uh, what does the open access cost cover, really? Should it cover uh, overheads, for example? Uh, how can you control intermediaries? How can you control uh, vendors in, a, in an open access world? What are the incentives to promote? I mean, very interesting and, and quite um, worrying uh, question. Uh, and basic questions like how will open access titles coexist with subscription collections? And those questions came clearly from, uh, from the people who are <clears throat> firstly impacted by, by that. Uh, all fully relevant uh, questions uh, and linked clearly to a major change uh, in what has to be a major change in business model, because as Eric Merkel Sobota said yes two days ago, which I found really a very good and 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 um, uh, very impacting um, comment, uh, saying that the open access movement is in in fact now turning it's it's all about an open access business model, uh, and indeed now that open access is here and and clearly here to stay. Um, we need to invent, uh, reinvent, maybe simply evolve um, business models that are sustainable. So that's probably the key word. Um, and we all know what the potential sources of, of income, of funding are. I mean, they're readers, they're authors, institutions, sponsors, advertisers, or mixes of thereof. So what are the options? Or at least what are some of the options? So this is broadly speaking, the, uh, what this session today is looking at with a focus on the humanities and social sciences area and probably more of a focus on books, uh, primarily because a lot has been said about, about journals. I mean, we're going to touch on journals as well, uh, but the, the primary focus will be, will be books. So the three speakers here are in the first presentation, which is open access for books, when and how. Francis Pinter will talk about the challenges set by implementing a sustainable open access policy in the world of books, focusing on how the economics of open access books differs from that of open access journals in terms of mandates, of licenses, uh, of value added. Uh, and she will look at experiments in the field with a focus on the uh, project of Knowledge Unlatched, uh, which she, uh, she launched, a company that she launched last year. Now, here, pour la petite histoire, uh, when I called uh, Frances a few months ago to ask her whether she would uh, she would accept to to come and and, and speak here, uh, I told her and your great project of knowledge unleashed, and so she sort of said knowledge unleashed. That's not at all what it is. She said knowledge unlatched. Now I'm a non-native speaker of English, so the the two in my mind had had clicked. And afterwards, I thought the unleashed part of it sounded really a little bit wild. Um, <laughs> But uh, we'll, we'll hear from her. Many of you know Frances, so I'm not going to, to dwell too long on, on her many lives as a publisher, as an entrepreneur. Uh, and currently, she's an interim CEO of Manchester University Press, publisher, previously of Bloomsbury Academic, publishing director for Soros's Open Society, already open, uh, consultant for Creative Commons. I, I will just say that from my selfish perspective as, as chair of this uh, panel, all of these lives are relevant to the issue at hand. And this is why I was very grateful that uh, Francis accepted to, to be on the panel. 
the second presentation, Pierre Mounier will focus on freemium as a sustainable economic model for uh, open access publishing. Now, freemium is one of the models that has emerged as an effective way of integrating open and pay, uh, and it brings together free, well, open access uh, to content with priced premium services. And it's a model that uh, seems particularly promising uh, for the economy of scholarly uh, book publishing. Uh, and it's per, in, in fact, for the, the, the book, the pub, uh, scholarly publishing uh, on, as a whole. Uh, because of the emphasis, primarily, I think, it places on, on usage. And I must confess, I'm personally very um, partial to the freemium model because uh, OECD Publishing has been developing this for a number of years and, and very successfully. Pierre will focus more particularly on the example of open edition, an online environment for open access publishing in humanities and social sciences. Pierre is associate director of open edition and a lecturer in digital humanities, that sounds very good, uh, at the EHESS, the Ecole des Hautes Etudes en Sciences Sociales in Paris. He has published several books on social and political impact of ICT, digital publishing, and digital humanities. In the third, last presentation, Making Open Pay Calls for an Open Mind. Now, I'll just stop here because you might have seen in the, in the brochure a completely different title, uh, a, a scary burning platform title. Now, I, I must say that Niels, coming back from holidays, had a change of heart, and <laughs> he's decided to take a, a more optimistic look uh, at, uh, at, at publishing and life in general, and to call this <laughs> an open mind. Um, so he will be looking, uh, Neil Stern will be looking at making open pay issue from a different perspective. And he's going to share with us his experience, or rather his journey, from a traditional uh, academic publisher to an IGO publisher uh, with a mandate to disseminate everything freely, uh, but also to create value for, for users and to do so in a sustainable way. Niels is head of publishing at the Nordic Council of Ministers the Nordic country's intergovernmental cooperation body, that sounds grand, and the project manager of the council's open access project. He has worked for over 10 years in e-publishing and research communications environments, and has actively participated in the OAPEN project. I never know how to pronounce that, not to keep, to confuse it purely with open, but again, uh, that's an, a language issue. Uh, one last word before passing over the floor to, to, to Francis. Um, I was just reading the other day a quite inspiring post by Kent Anderson uh, on uh, called Conversations We're Not Having, which maybe some of you have read, about open access in which it touches on misunderstandings and, and pitfalls of the open access implementation uh, for all actors involved. And he also touches on a number of questions that haven't been answered and a number of questions that haven't even been asked so far. Uh, but which are absolutely essential for the, the eco our, our ecosystem. And reading this post, I was thinking it would be nice of, you know, if today's uh, panel sparked uh, at least some of these uh, discussions we are not having, if we could have some of them, whether today or in, in, the, uh, in, in the near future. So that would be really great uh, if we could have engaged in a, in a discussion after the three presentations. Thank you very much, and without further ado, over to Francis. Uh, good morning. So here we are at the last session. Uh, I'm going to uh, talk only about books. That's um, what I've been working on for an awfully long time. Uh, but I do want to say that we see, looking forward, a day when the long-form publication and the short-form publication kind of merge and are quite similar in terms of how they get to be produced and how they get to a point where they are paid for and most likely in due course for scholarly communications in open access. However, <laughs> as uh, some of you know, the Finch Report did say in its one and a half pages on books, in its 150 page report, that monographs were actually much more complicated than uh, than, book, uh, than journal articles 
because they had a different business model and getting from closed to open would be uh, very much more difficult. Uh, that's because books, that the word itself uh, straddles a whole number of different types of models, business models, uh, the business model for the monograph to the uh, textbook to the course book to the reference book. These are all different business models, uh, not to mention general books and, and the channels are different and the types of formats that are, are required at the moment are, are very many. Uh, and I, recently I had a conversation with John Ingram who said that a vital source they can spit out 200 different formats for digital content. Uh, and I thought the 20 that we were dealing with as ordinary academic publishers uh, was a lot. So we're starting from a different place. And so we can't just replicate the APC in something that's called a BPC, book processing charge, because that's not how uh, we're gonna get to open access for scholarly books and I am just talking about scholarly books. And you see sustainable pathways, see the plural, that S is really important because we're going to have lots of models. I'm just gonna say a few more words without slides, uh, some generic issues, uh, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about Knowledge Unlatched, which some of you have heard about um, at other conferences, so I apologize, but at least it'll be much shorter than it usually is as a presentation. So getting to OA is going to be harder. Uh, the income uh, to publishers for the kinds of books that we're talking about, the monograph loosely dis defined, um, is going to be a mixture. And what in the journal world gets talked about as secondary income sources, like when somebody doesn't have access to the whole journal and buys an individual journal article for $30, it's, it's kind of the, almost the other way around in that there's a lot of potential with the content from the long form publication to make money. And that's one of the things, that, that's what we're going to be hearing about and concentrating on uh, in this session. The problem is we don't know yet where in the continuum we should be looking for upfront funding from what I call the someone pays model to uh, the income that comes from the individual unit sales selling, whether it's digital or print, one by one by one to individual people who want those sorts of formats. So we need to know as we move forward, what are the trade-offs going to be as we find some way of funding the origination costs, and other ways of satisfying the needs and expectations of users who want choice in how they access content and also to pay for the um, added value that we as publishers might be creating and obviously would wish to be recompensed for. Um, and and th those goalposts keep on changing, but certainly in the humanities and social sciences, Lots of people still like to read the printed book and, and probably will for a while. So you know, we have to serve that market. So what are the issues that we have to think about? Uh, we have to think about the uh, market for the different formats. What are the channels? Which channels are drying up? Which channels are, are serving us as publishers well? I won't even go into the whole intermediaries role, but that's a very big issue, um, as we all know. What kind of added value services will our users be willing to pay for? What do they want? Um, the enhanced ebook, all singing, dancing, uh, collections, platforms, et cetera. We really don't know yet because we're too early in the whole process to have enough evidence as to what works and what doesn't work. Um, and at the same time, the way research is changing is something that we have to take cognizant of. Uh, we have to be aware that digital is riding railroads through disciplines in different ways. We, we saw that 
uh, from the students to earlier on, it's a pity we didn't have the humanities person because uh, they think very differently. And even there, there are subsets. Uh, you know, there's the digital humanities people who do wonderful, exciting data mining stuff, which some of the traditional historians, you know, they haven't got their head around that. So those disciplines are changing too, and we're trying to serve all those people. Um, and what are the IP issues? Licensing. Uh, it's really important as we move forward to open access that we understand what we are doing with the way that we're licensing. Now, I'm going to give you a, a little example. Um, that I know of three publishers that have uh, offered to make books open access. There's Palgrave with its 11,000 pound fee. There's Springer with its 15,000 euro fee. There's Manchester, which has a, a scale of 5,900 to 7,800 pounds, depending on the length. Now, the ignorant sector of uh, the uh, people who are complaining uh, say, well, why is Paul Gray sell selling this at such a high price? Well, if you look carefully at the licensing, and I haven't discussed this with Paul Gray, this is, I'm, I'm just taking a view about this, and correct me if I'm wrong, Hazel, um, but Paul Grave is issuing the content on a CC BY license, and Manchester is issuing it on a CC BY NC license. So the implications are very real. Paul Grave is saying, we've done this, and we will take care of the content uh, as it you know, needs to be preserved and all of that. But we're not anticipating any additional revenue. If there is some, that would be great. Um, whereas Manchester is, it, and this was done by my predecessor, uh, is positioning itself saying, well, actually, we think if we control the commercialization of this content, that would um, enable us to have additional revenue streams. Uh, who's right? Who's wrong? Um, we don't know yet. It's just wonderful that we're all testing. Now, of course, there are lots of more granular points to this, but I don't have time to go into it. Um, maybe Hazel can say a bit more. Um, third party per permissions. Uh, we can't just throw things up online uh, uh, willy nilly on an open license. Even if the author agrees, what kind of permissions did they get for the content? Uh, for pictures, for whatever. The, try telling Getty that you want to put 20 of their pictures on Creative Commons license. These, these are all things that we need to look at. And the mandates, of course. Um, th I was going to go through the mandates, but that was thankfully dealt with um, yesterday. So I, I won't do that except to say that I want you to think forward five years, 10 years, 20 years. And it doesn't really matter whether you think mandates are coming immediately or in the midterm or in the long term. It doesn't really matter what you think at this point about which disciplines it's going to affect. My personal view, i just throw it up, is we can't um, imagine, I can't imagine a world where science, hard science, physical sciences, is motoring along quite happily with an open environment. We've made the transition with journal articles being published and APCs being paid, and whether it's gold or green, it's somehow or another, most of the research that's publicly funded is publicly made available. But at the other end of the spectrum, where you have humanities, where books long-form publication, it's an important part of their output. They can't just write everything in a short article. It's not appropriate um, for developing complex theories, etc. Now, should that remain closed just because we haven't got an open access model that works for books? I would suggest not, because that certainly will shoot that discipline in the foot. They have to demonstrate impact just as much as the medical scientist. Um, and if it, the content remains closed, how are you going to measure impact? 
all the new ways that are coming down the road. So I, I would just say, think about that. Um, when you think that, oh, well, it's not coming for the, uh, the humanities or the social sciences, uh, it's not coming for monographs. It is, it has to, ultimately. We have to get there. Um, so the final point I want to make before I go quickly into Knowledge Unlatched is what happens when a book is open? We get terribly obsessed in measuring, uh, you know, will this book sell enough to cover its, um, it, it, its, um, its origination costs? Uh, will we get enough funding to make it viable, to make it open access? And of course, all publishers would like to have enough funding so that even if all their sales are cannibalized, they'll be okay. Um, but I would suggest, given what's happening, all the other changes that are happening in the ecosystem, we really have to consider what, what are the serendipitous things that can happen? What are the things that didn't happen before that can happen now? And I'm going to get, tell a story. And it's a story that I tell quite often. And the man who made the bet is actually in the room. So he knows the story. When I was at Bloomsbury Academic, we published books, monographs on a Creative Commons non-commercial license. Uh, overall, they've done very well. On balance, 10 to 20 percent more than the equivalent closed model, but it's early days, not a huge sample. But there's one book I want to tell you about. An acquisitions meeting, an editor came along with a book called The Precariat. And she said, she wants to publish this, and here were the figures. The sales team went berserk. They said, you can't publish a book called The Precariat. Nobody knows what it means. Uh, you know, Publishing 101, you put in the title what the book's about. Uh, keywords, don't you know that? Uh, but the editor just persisted and persisted, and she just, we got tired and basically said, okay, all right, we're going to publish this. And uh, Jonathan had a bet uh, with the editor. I uh, said, we're not going to sell more than 500 copies of this. I'll bet you a fiver. Now, then we published it. It was online for free. It was selling modestly. And then one day something happened, which is really interesting. We got a phone call. The marketing department got a phone call from somebody who said, I've read this book online, and I'd really like a copy. Could you please send me one? And the marketing department did. And it was... Then we suddenly saw an amazing thing happen. The book started selling, and it sold 5,000 copies. Now, why did this happen? How did we tie this together? Well, the person who uh, asked for the copy was someone we would never have thought of sending a review copy. It was Noam Chomsky. And when he started talking about the book at conferences he was attending, that was the pull through. We didn't have to do anything. We just had to put the thing online. <laughs> uh, and it sold 5,000 copies. It's now in trade paperback. And I hope that Jonathan has paid Caroline the five pounds. So that, that was a really good thing to do. Now I'm going to have, uh, I've actually got one slide which I want to just very quickly talk to you about. This is. The, the everyone pays, well, who pays? These are some of the models. Um, Catherine, how long do I have? I've another five minutes, uh, another even seven. All right, well, I'm going to run through this very quickly because I do want to tell you about Knowledge Unlatched. So open it. Uh, these are how, how these things are funded. Well, funding from the income of print or e-books, that's something that uh, there are examples of it. Bloomsbury Academic uh, did this. There were no subsidies. There was no author payment. It was just faith that we would sell enough to make this work. Will it work for all books? Of course not. Um, institutional support for the press, as I'm sure you all know, the World Bank from up high decided that everything had to be open access, and the publisher was told, make it happen. So he did. 
and got the various departments to pay for the publishing process. Amherst College, interesting um, initiative. It's an ebook only publishing operation. What did they do? How are they funding it? Uh, they took two posts from the library and allocated it to publishing. Who knows what that will bring? We'll see. Um, library Press Collaboration and Publishing in Michigan is an example. Have a look at that. Library publishing in the United States, 50 uh, li university libraries have gotten together to, um, to do a study, a two-year-long study of whether they should go into publishing. Now, this is interesting libraries going into publishing, what do we as publishers have to say about that? What are we going to do to collaborate with them if they do decide to go ahead? Then there's the funding side uh, from various funding bodies, um, mostly state, not always, for instance, Welcome UK, uh, author side publication uh, fee, we talked about that, university budgets, BPCs, is that going to happen in the way that APCs are happening? We don't know. And then there's library consortium idea, which is what I've been working on. So Knowledge Unlatched is a not-for-profit. If I'm racing through this, just have a look at the website, please. Um, and the idea is to help publishers recover the origination costs of their monographs and helping libraries from around the world to share the costs of making the books open access. So basically, I'm creating a library consortium which will pay for the origination fees plus associated overheads, a BPC if you like, but instead of it coming from the author, instead of it coming from a funding body, it's coming from this library consortium. And that talk about the licenses and its front list titles. And the goals is to make open access for humanities and social sciences sustainable and ensuring that they don't get left behind while articles rush into uh, open access. And how does it work? Um, we're just about to launch. Uh, we have the publishers signed up. We have 13 in our pilot. Uh, we have uh, a small collection of books from that 13. And each of them have set a title fee. I haven't called it a BPC. I've called it a title fee for opening up access. And publishers will be paid that fee, provided I manage to interest enough university libraries, research libraries primarily, around the world to join this consortium. We spent a whole year doing market research. I think we'll get there. Um, everything's in place except for one publisher who hasn't submitted their metadata. So, and they're in this room. So we're almost there. Um, so I've told you what the title fee is. and. The beauty about this is that there's, I hope, there'll be peer pressure that more and more libraries to join because if a title fee is $10,000 or $15,000, as you can see from that table, the more libraries that join, the lower the fee per library. So this should be a good deal for the library. Um, there's the uh, little bit about the first collection we're aiming priced that we only make it with 200 libraries. I hope it'll be more, but we had to cap the price, and, and that's uh, where we are. That's what it would cost a library. The average fee, title fee is coming in at $12,000. So publishers set their own license fees, and that's the average, $12,000. And that's a summary of how it works. Um, I won't go through all the steps, but basically we're the, the middlemen <laughs> in between the publishers and the libraries, and we make sure that the um, publishers deliver the open access content. It'll be on OAPEN and Hattie Trust, and it allows the, the, uh, the, everything else to happen as normal uh, in the, the blue sectors. Publishers sell, uh, libraries buy other versions, and a lot of libraries have said, well, it's all very nice to have you know, participate in unlatching, but we really want the one that's in Muse as well. So we've organized that they get a discount because they can't have them double dipped. Uh, and that's working well. Um, and so there we are. We have four subject areas that are being covered by those 30 books. Um, 
in future, well, here's the list of the uh, publishers. There's large publishers, small publishers, university press, uh, commercial publishers, uh, US, UK, and continental publishers, uh, all represented there. Uh, the timeline, get that single collection out, uh, get, uh, we'll ha we have the cap, uh, so libraries know that we either get the 200 libraries or if we don't, we fail. That's the whole point of a pilot. Um, I'm reasonably confident we'll make it, but we have a, a four month window to sell to those 200 libraries. And we've had some amazing backers. Uh, we've had support from the British Library, from the New York Public Library, from Harvard, from Queensland University of Technology, the Max Planck Society, etc. And then once we do the pilot, we just do it again. Uh, bigger, better, more publishers. We've already got a queue of other publishers wanting to join. So if you're interested, let me know. Um, and how do we make Knowledge Unlatched itself sustainable? Well, we've had grants, and that runs for the first three years. And then once we scale up, we'll take a 5% cut uh, to fund the office, uh, sort of like a subscription agency. Um, who benefits? Readers, libraries, authors, independent researchers, publishers. I think everyone else does too. So this is one of the pathways, just one of the pathways. And particularly that article that you mentioned in Scholarly Kitchen, which says, oh, there's a danger of government control over content, over what gets published if we go down the APC route. And that's a very real concern of academics, too. Um, and so if we have multiple ways of getting to open access, we dissipate that. Um, so that's, that's my contribution to making open access work. And here we have some others. Thank you.